good morning. I, uh, I wanted to thank you for being here so early uh, every morning. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, even though I don't assign points for, for this, I appreciate it. Thank you. So today I want to uh, continue with, uh, with the testing uh, lectures. And in some sense, I think it's uh, part of the, is the most interesting part of testing when you have to really think how to test the hardest to test parts, uh, parts of your code. And uh, for that purpose, I generally uh, find useful to, to implement fake objects, which are really alternate implementations of collaborators that for whatever reasons you want to avoid using in, in tests. And uh, these reasons might be uh, your collaborator is not yet developed. This will happen to your, your project. You are starting to work on the back end, well, but the front end is nowhere ready. So put some time into writing a little script that will exercise your back end in a similar way to the client. And that's going to allow you to, to get going. Um, so the second reason that I'm listing here on the slide, uh, the major interface of the system, it's another reason why you should mark the client and uh, perhaps perhaps the client team should, uh, should mark the, the back end. Uh, because that's a major interface in the system, and uh, it's also um, an interface between two separate processes, so that's generally slow, uh, slow to test. You don't want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, if you have a collaborator that's really too heavy or too slow, or it has shared state that you don't want to, to mess with, uh, for example, a, a web service or, or a database, you have to really think how you're going to use that in, in tests. This is a significant investment. I'm not going to say that you just press a few buttons, you get a few libraries, and you have it. You actually have to sit down and think, uh, this collaborator, uh, what is essential for you, and you have to re-implement it. And if this is like a Dropbox API, as I'm going to get to at the end of this lecture, you're going to implement a really, really small Dropbox kind of uh, system. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm talking uh, orders of magnitude smaller, but it's still something you you would implement. So um, I want to demonstrate this in, a, in an example that it's a little bit extreme. It's not quite uh, what you have in everyday programming, but it, I think it's uh, for its size, it has an uh, extremely large amount of, uh, of testing difficulties. So this is a system that monitors air temperature over time and triggers alerts. Okay. It could be a very important system, but it's also a system that uses a lot of collaborators. You're going to see. So uh, there's a main uh, function here that has two entry points. One is to start the monitoring, and then it keeps going. And then there's an entry point here that gets called from a timer uh, at uh, particular time intervals. And this is when, when the thinking actually happens of uh, what is the temperature, how much did it go up, and whether we need to send an alert. The alerter is a separate, is a separate component that maybe sends a uh, uh, SMS messages or emails or even uh, sends this request to web services that uh, are very sophisticated in how they alert different people in your team. Um, um, of course, you would need to have a collaborator to get the temperature, wherever you are measuring the temperature. So let's say this is for a temp provider and has a get temp uh, method. And uh, finally, the last piece it needs is a, is a time uh, provider uh, who should be able to give you the current time for the calculations that you're doing in here. And also, let's say that the timer uh, is, is implemented in the time provider. And the way you use this timer is uh, the main method will tell the collaborator, will give it the reference to this on tick callback, and will say register on tick. And then the time provider will think about uh, calling on tick periodically, uh, which will uh, Read the temperature and, and so on. Okay. Is this uh, is this clear how it goes? Okay. Maybe I should have used the UML uh, sequence diagrams. It would be even clearer. But uh, at that point, actually, that, that would be a good uh, good midpoint question. Now that I think about it. Um, okay. So there are many reasons why why you would want to use uh, without the, to, you want you want to use mocks to test without the, the collaborators. So first, uh, you're implementing this at your desk. You may not have the temperature sensor. Okay? So you need some way to, to take it. Uh, 
This is a system that uses time in its calculations. Okay? So necessarily, if you don't mark time, uh, you'll have to wait for whatever time it's programmed to wait until it triggers an alert. That will make even your uh, smallest test very, uh, very sh slow. Then there are exceptional scenarios having to do with temperature and having to do with time. Uh, you want to mark those to be able to reproduce those very quickly on command. And uh, furthermore, let's say that you don't care about uh, slowness of test in exceptional situations. Then because you're depending on so many collaborators that depend on you know, physical values outside, tests might be hard to reproduce. Uh, because unless you get the temperature to, to uh, follow the same trajectory as in the past test, the behavior of your curve might be different, depending on how, how smart it tries to be. Okay? So these are all problems that can be addressed with, with marking. So let's actually start to write these marks, because it may seem, well, how am I going to mark time? Time is something so essential that, you know, how am I going to mark it? Uh, well, it turns out... Uh, Time is a deep concept, but the way your program uses it is very shallow. And this is the key. And Dropbox, it's a very complex system, but the way your program uses it is very shallow. So all you need to mark is what uh, the API, the abstraction that your program needs for that, uh, for that big API. Okay? And that's where, that's where the secret is to make this actually feasible. So let's see how you mark time. So we said time for us has two has an interface with get time and register on tick, essentially uh, register with the time. So typically, all of these fake objects uh, have some internal state and have an interface that mimics the interface of the real thing. So get time and register on tick. What the what you do here is typically much simpler than the real thing. Uh, so, for example, this fake time provider, uh, it looks like it has a variable that stores the times. So somebody will program this object, uh, probably in test. Your test code will program this object to say, if somebody asks you, say it's 9.30 on Thursday morning. And no matter how many times they ask you, you just say that time. Okay? So it's as simple as, as the one line. And the register on tick, is actually uh, somewhat similar to the actual time provider. It's a loop that actually makes calls to this uh, one thing. Okay. Uh, so there's a second interface in the same object that's the configuration interface. This does not exist in the real time provider. Uh, and this is not used by your production code. This is only used by your test code to prepare the fake object for behaving the way the test wants, configuring it. Now look what I've done here. This is actually uh, four lines that are extremely powerful. This will make all the difference in test. And when you see this running, it's, it's kind of amazing. Uh, what does it do? Uh, so the test will tell the time provider to start at a particular time and to, uh, to essentially go all the way to, uh, to the end time. And so you set the current time to start. And once you set it, uh, no matter who calls this object, it will report this time. And then you go into a loop all the way to end, increment the time by one second, and then call all of the handlers that were registered. Okay? And then when all the handlers that were registered with you have done their work, okay, everybody is waiting to be called next. So in some way, they are waiting for the next second to pass. Well, you can do that instantaneously and move to the next second. Okay? The rest of your code wouldn't be able to tell that time hasn't passed, actually. Because you call everybody, say, do, do your work for this second. Everybody returns. You say, now time has moved by one second. And do your more work. These other collaborators of yours are going to go read the time. And they're going to see that, indeed, the second has passed because you've incremented time. And this way, uh, you can have a collaborator that says, you know, call me in 60 seconds. Essentially ignore the first 59 times it gets called. And instead of waiting a minute for that test to run, this will happen instantly.
because this loop will go around 60 times very fast if nobody does anything on the on the count. Questions? Okay, this is very small, but it will make, a, a, you'll see tests that run for five minutes, they'll run in 50 milliseconds now. The same exact functionality. Okay. So this is a typical way to fake time. Now, you don't have to write this code, even though it's, it's only kind of half a page of code. Uh, there are libraries that fake time, for Ruby, for Python, for most, uh, most languages. Um, okay, so every loop iteration simulates a second. Tests are now uh, synchronous and fast. You don't have to wait for the time to pass for these on handles to be called. And you can simulate many uh, seconds in one second of actual uh, test run. Yes? What do you mean by tests are synchronous? Well, that's a little bit of a, of a, mis, of a misnomer. Um, in the, if, if you run with the real time, and you put a breakpoint in the on tick handler, you don't have control of when that gets called. It gets called asynchronously by, by the system. Okay? Asynchronous with respect to your test and your, your production code. But now you've brought that logic into your test. So you know that all of your on tick handlers get called from here. So you can put a breakpoint here, essentially, and say, <coughs> okay, stop me next time the next second have passed. And that's really what I'm trying to say. So if you don't like the word synchronous, it doesn't matter. It's not important. Fast is important. Um, okay? So that was with the time. Now we can actually uh, not only fake time, but speed it up. Uh, for the temperature provider, well, here, you may have to write um, different fakes depending on what complex scenarios uh, you're planning to, to simulate. So let's say that for our needs, knowing what the logic for alerts is going to be, we're going to be simulating uh, a temperature uh, uh, dynamic of this form. So it starts uh, with an initial temperature. It increases over time at a certain rate, so this is fixed by the test, and then it stops, it plateaus. We're gonna be simulating these, uh, these shapes of temperature uh, dynamics uh, with three parameters, the start, the slope, and the end, okay? Um, and you're thinking, okay, uh, in knowing what kind of logic you're gonna have in test, this is gonna allow you, with different slopes, different starts, different ends, to simulate a lot of your scenarios. Um, so again, the interface that's, that mimics the real thing, the temperature, and again, it's gonna return a pre-programmed uh, temperature. And then the configuration interface, um, which uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so the entry point is this fake step function, which the test will call, it will give it a, uh, a time provider, because we're going to make this fake temperature provider return different things over time. So it has to have a notion of time. And it's going to get it from the time provider. Uh, it's going to have a start, a rate, and an end, the three parameters that I had on the board. So uh, let's uh, look at the second line. It's going to initialize the temperature to start. It's going to remember the rate and the end. And it's going to piggyback on this time provider to tell the type provider, okay, next every second call me, call this function. So our fake provider registers into the same uh, timer mechanism that, that we're using. And for every second, we're increasing the temperature by this rate uh, until we reach L. Do you see how this, how this is gonna work? Um, okay. And, uh, so once your test calls fake step, everything is set up. The values are set up. It's ready to be called when time advances. And it returns to the test. And now everything waits for you to start, uh, to start the test. I'm going to go a slide back. And that's when the test is going to call start fake. And this is going to start uh, advancing the time, which advances the mock time here. 
which will eventually call into the fake temperature provided to advance the temperature and will call into the actual production code to do its logic. Okay, so you just put everything together. And we're talking, uh, you know, two pages of code, let's say, one for the fake temperature provider, one for the fake uh, time. So you have now have a lot of power to make your tests fast, to be able to produce arbitrary scenarios, arbitrary times, you know, daylight savings changes and, and stuff like that. Uh, but it, it requires some investment, yes. You have to write some code for this. Now, many people say they don't like testing. Yes, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't like clicking buttons for the whole day to see what happens. But with testing is thinking how to program these kind of smart alternates, doubles for your code. Then I view it as programming. Okay? And then I like it. I hope, I hope you'll be safe. Any questions? Questions, this is crystal clear. Okay, um, I, I want to say a few more things that are probably closer to your, uh, your project in terms of uh, fakes. Uh, a database is used in many, in many projects, and all of you will use a database in your web uh, applications because it's the, it's the common way to actually store state in a, in a backend. And we will actually look in a few lectures when you look at how you deploy these applications to be able to handle a lot of requests why a database is, is more important than having some objects in memory that stores data. Okay? But let's say we use a database. Now a database is a massive thing. It's many times more complicated than your project. It's many times slower, probably, than the logic of your project. And it runs in a separate process. Not, it's not inside process. You have to talk over sockets to the database. It's a big beast to use to run a small unit test for your code. Um, and I've done an experiment uh, in, in Django, uh, a fairly small test, I, I call it unit test, that uh, requests several models, it does some operations, makes some updates. Uh, I counted uh, 20 SQL queries in, in, uh, in this test, and it took about five seconds when, by, with the default configuration of my SQL. And that's a long time. It takes five seconds because all my SQL is a beast. The test framework, Django, knows that you are testing, so it's going to set up a separate testing database. It's going to clear out the entire database, create all the tables with the schema that it has, and then the test actually starts running. Some of these queries probably are populating the first few records in the database. And then the actual test is going to start doing something to those records and writing them. And one thing I actually do want to point here, uh, is a benefit for you for coming early, a lesson. Uh, these frameworks, Django and Rails, they do a lot of stuff under the hood. And that's all nice and dandy when you're doing a hello world. But sometimes, if you turn on debugging and look at the queries that go out to the database, you get scared. Uh, because those are not written by you by hand, carefully thinking what actually you need. This is a tool that tries to guess what you need. And Sometimes it issues the same request three times for one, uh, for one test, simply because it doesn't have an idea that uh, it's, the same, it's the same request. And all you did wrote this accessor that looks like a reading, a, invoking an innocuous method in, in Rails. And then you wrote it again next time, because it's just two words. And that you know, turns into SQL queries. So uh, do look under the hood. It's going to bite you once you start Know, moving from playing to actually doing something serious. So find, find a way to turn on uh, this debugging block so just see what's going on to the database. Anyway, five seconds for a test, not acceptable. Um, the, first thing I, the first thing I do is to realize I don't need the whole database. My SQL has all sorts of features, transactions, and, and uh, scalability, and all that. Uh, I don't need all of that for my unit tests. Um, so why don't we replace the database with SQLite 3 for tests? SQLite 3 is not something we want to run in production. Okay? It doesn't have some of the important features that we have a million users. But for a test, uh, especially since Django 
uh, or Rails will go to a great length to give you the same active record interface to the database, whether it's SQLite 3 or MySQL. It's very easy to switch them. It's a configuration line in my config file saying, if I'm testing, use SQLite 3. If I'm not testing, use, use MySQL. 150 milliseconds with SQLite 3. Why do you think SQLite 3 is so much faster than MySQL? Happens to be the same reason why I don't want to use the introduction. More people? How many of you have heard of SQLite 3? How many of you have, have used SQLite 3? Okay? And you don't know why it's fast. So why did you use it? Because it's default. Okay. It's the only thing I can use in iOS. In iOS, fine. Uh, but you should, I mean, again, I'm going to go back to uh, preaching. You should eat broccoli. You should look under the hood. Uh, you are professionals. You are not amateurs who to pick this up from a, a few blogs and then go say they know how to do web apps. Okay? You want to be the person who knows what's going on when things are breaking. Not for a hell of a world, when, when you have a lot of users. So be curious. SQLite 3 is uh, essentially an uh, in-process database. So when you use SQLite 3, all the logic of the database is loaded as a library inside your process. Okay? So you don't have to talk over uh, sockets to another, to another process. Okay? And it, it's, it's actually very simple. It stores data, but it doesn't have the concurrency features of MySQL. You can have multiple applications using it at the same time and so on. But don't they have a file that is not SQL like something? Yeah, there's a file, but there's there's very few guarantees about when stuff gets set, stored in that file. MySQL will guarantee you that if power goes out in the middle of your query, there's a well-defined behavior. Re restart your machine, the database is in a good state. SQL like 3, no such guarantees. So it's like loaded to the memory and everything goes through the memory and sometime later it could get right. Precisely, yes. Okay. And it doesn't even try hard to give you guarantees. Okay? Uh, if, if, you know, in an ideal world, it's a fine thing, uh, but it's not really good for high concurrent applications. But, and it, you, get, you get speed. And for something like iOS, you can't put MySQL on iOS. So this is why you're going to have it. But on iOS, you also don't have the concurrency you need that you have on a real app. Anyway, so this is one line change in your test. But you only do it, of course, if you know that you want that. In some applications, uh, I have one pretty big application in which my interface to the database is actually much narrower than the whole active record uh, API. So I only have a, a handful of operations I'm doing. So I actually built an in-memory hash table that stores my data. And uh, that's you know, 10 milliseconds. There's no, no file here to store. Because for a test, I mean, I, all I need is actually to destroy the database and start, use it, and then throw it away. So in-memory database is perfectly fine. So look at the difference. That's a factor of 100. Uh, it really makes a big, big difference on how you even think about testing. Because with this, I now run 100 tests every five minutes. Because it only requires you know, one keystroke to run my tests and know that I haven't you know, regressed. With this, I'm going to think twice. I'm going to run the test in the coffee break, probably, only. Okay. Questions? OK, so uh, I hope you'll, uh, you'll think about this when you, when you set up your testing. Um, actually. This is uh, everything stuff I've covered uh, already. Okay, so learn what your framework gives you for testing and take advantage of it. And by the way, I should say that uh, this notion of frameworks for writing applications is fairly new. It didn't wasn't used much ten years ago. Now everybody would use Rails or Django if you want to use Python. One of the things that frameworks do because they force everybody to structure the application in a certain way, to access the database in a certain way, they now can give you the benefit of different kind of implementations for the same abstraction, because a lot of people are using that abstraction. Okay? So if you don't use frameworks and implement everything from scratch, from the database all the way up, 
then you are going to have to design an architect into your application and an interface that like the framework that allows you to switch the databases for testing and such. So that's you know, designing for testability. Good news is if you use Django and Rails, they've designed for testability uh, to a certain extent, at this level at least. Interfaces higher up in your application, that's all yours, designed properly. Okay, so that ends uh, one set of slides, and I'm gonna transition right away into um, the next set of slides. Because, uh, and the objective now is to take all of these fake implementations that we wrote and see how you actually mix them up with the production code during testing. The, the lesson learned, essentially, in the rest of this lecture will be if you don't write your production code properly, it's going to be hard to inject this space when you want to test. Okay? So that's why the, the, the title of this uh, slide deck, where I'm starting on slide six because the first few slides are a review of what we've just done. Uh, so the purpose of this lecture is to actually think about how you would structure your code to, uh, to be able to do testing. Okay, so it, uh, it, it kind of follows from where we saw the uh, fake temperatures and time provided. How they design code so that you can easily inject the, the fix. And the technique that we'll learn uh, is, is generally called dependency injection, which means injecting the code you are depending on, the collaborator. It's a, it's a generic technique that uh, sometimes you do by hand. It's also a technique that you can do by, by tools. And we'll, we'll talk about dependency injection uh, libraries. OK, so let's uh, look at how somebody may have written this uh, main logic of your application that does the thinking about how to, do, um, how to send alerts when temperature changes. And this is a bad way to write it. But let's go over it, because this, this is the first impulse of writing if you don't think about how, you, how you're going to test it. If you just think about how it's going to run in production. So on tick gets called every second. And uh, first you read the time, the current time. And then uh, you have some logic that goes and reaches out to, uh, to the sensors that you have. So you're going to read the temperature in there. And then you have some logic that decides whether to alert. And this could really be complex if your application is a serious one. It has some state, remembering what was the last temperature they read, when, how long, how much time it passed, when was the last time they sent an alert, maybe they need to send a reminder, all that stuff. Uh, there's some conditionals here, probably some tables, some looking up the state. And then uh, somewhere in that logic, or at the end of that logic, uh, you actually decide to actually send an alert to the alerter, or not to alert, and then, then you essentially stop, you wait for the next second to pass to do some more uh, work. The problem with this code is that it mixes up uh, the stuff that you truly should be testing uh, in a lot of corner cases with the stuff that's very hard to test. It's very hard to actually you know, get to the temperature or send the alerts. You don't want to do that in test. But this is the part that you want to test, this complex decision logic uh, or even if reading the sensors is more than just you know calling them in sequence, if you have complex logic there, you want to test that. Uh, you don't so much want to test the temperature uh, sensor or the alerter. Those have separate tests, but not not for this uh, for this part. Okay. So this is how uh, how you proceed. And by by now you you kind of seen this. Uh, you've seen me doing it um, during the demo when I when I demo test your development. You use extraction refactor, which means you rearrange your code uh, to hoist out the complex logic that does not have interaction with the outside world, with the collaborators. So I've taken the complexity, uh, and I call it logic. And I know that this logic depends on the current time and temperature, but I'm not letting it reach out the sensors to get the temperature. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to pass those values in it. So you think, what is all that your logic needs from the collaborators? Gather that stuff and pass it nicely into the complex logic. 
let the complex logic do you know, its computation independent of the, of the collaborators. And when it's about to send an alert, don't let it send an alert. Say, tell me if you want to send an alert. So I kind of change it to return uh, the alert to be sent. And sometimes you may need to return multiple things from this code. Okay? And now what's left, this is what's left of the original code. Uh, I'm reading the time. I'm reading the temperature. So I'm re reaching out to the collaborators, gathering the data, passing the, the data into this uh, complex logic. And then if the complex logic says that I should alert, call the alert. Okay? So uh, this is called, so the technique is called extract method refactoring. And you've seen me use PyCharm. And RubyMine can do the same. You just highlight the lines that you want extracted. And uh, it'll do most of the work uh, for you. But it's even easy to do by hand. That's not a problem. Uh, sometimes this is called, uh, this is called the smart code. And this is called the humble uh, code, I think. Okay? Humble because they didn't want to use stupid. But the idea is, this is simple. Uh, it, it does all of the reaching out to collaborators, so it's slow. It has a lot of dependencies. Hard to test this one. But look at it. It's hard to get it wrong. Because there's no conditionals for the most part. There's no loops in here. There's no complex calculations that are going to get wrong. All that is in here, which is very fast. It doesn't reach out. Uh, and by, by passing in carefully constructed time values and temperature values and calling it multiple times, uh, you can simulate very interesting scenarios. And so most of your testing is in here. And you're going to have one or two tests that are slow that use, use this logic. But those tests are not going to try to do something fancy like simulate the daylight savings time. No, they're just going to check that you're actually reaching out and getting some values for this. Okay. Is, that, is that clear? Okay. So please try to write code to be testable like this. Um, OK, so moving along. Uh, now you've separated out the dependence logic from the independent logic, the humble code from the, from the smart code, smart and complex code. Uh, but sometimes either you can do that easily, maybe, maybe the, your logic is not as simple as read the sensors and then think about it. It's maybe there's an interaction with the sensors. Depending on what you read from one, you may go read others. Okay, so it's kind of harder to separate out from interacting with the sensors. Um, so what can you do then? Um, well, it, again, uh, how easily you can test that? It depends how you write the code. This is a bad way of writing uh, writing your code, because uh, but but it's a common way of doing. It. And it's perhaps the first impulse on how to write. Okay? This is the constructor for your main class. And let's say that um, this constructor will, uh, it, you write it such that it needs as an argument something that's expensive, complicated to, to obtain. Maybe it's a reference to some object that's, that's hard to construct. Um, and uh, it will also. It will also instantiate directly these, uh, these providers and have references to it. This seems actually reasonable because if you're going to use this a lot in your rest of the method, it makes sense to kind of initialize them in the constructor. That gives you the sense that once I call the constructor, the object is ready to use. It's all constructed. It has done all of this initialization. Okay? But the problem is. Uh, it's hard to tell to call this constructor because first it, it has some parameters that are not easy to to um, construct in tests, and uh, furthermore, it actually reaches out to its collaborators, and even worse, sometimes people will further go and initialize these uh, these collaborators, essentially do something with them. We'll, we'll, we'll do something with this expensive to get thing. We'll do something with the time provider, with the alerter. Maybe I'll send a hello um, message or so on. And again, you do this because you want to say everything that has to do with initializing should be in the constructor. 
But that's actually bad for testing. And it's bad for testing because the constructor has a very special role in your program. Essentially, you cannot run any method, no matter how trivial, on that object without constructing the object. So imagine that further down, you have a method that is actually doesn't need an alert and doesn't need this expensive to get thing. Okay? You can't invoke that method without constructing the object. But to construct the object, you have to bring all this mess together just to construct the object. Okay? So the lesson is keep constructors simple. Um, actually, before we go there, there's another thing that you may do even before simplifying the constructor. You have to think for your methods, do they really need an instance? Is this a method that needs access to the state of the instance, or is more of a helper method that is generally useful for all of the instances? So those are called static methods or class methods. Okay? Um, this ID that I told you about, PyCharm, RubyMine, We'll put a squiggle on your method, say this method doesn't need to be an instance method, it can be a static method. Okay? And you, you click on it, and it gives you the option to turn it into a static method. Uh, the advantage of static methods is that you can test them without constructing an object. So no matter how complex the constructor is, you can test your static method. Um, generally, removing false dependencies from your code. Uh, it's a good thing. So this method now is static. It means it doesn't depend on the on an instance. Doesn't depend on the constructor. So that's good. Makes your code more modular. Uh, okay. However, I, I wanted to inject this thought in there. But however, most of the methods you're going to write, they need access to the state. So you can't apply this trick. Um, so what you do then is you actually uh, think very consciously to do as little work as possible in the constructor. Uh, for example, um, let's see. Um, instead of the first step I'm doing here, I'm removing that, that kind of complicated, uh, hard to get argument. And uh, you may pass that stuff to other methods when they, when they need it. But I'm also separating out the, initially the, the creation of the object from starting to use its collaborators. So this is a common pattern that you see. You have a constructor and you have a separate start method. And notice that this is the method that actually starts using the collaborators. So the active code from a constructor gets moved outside of the constructor. This allows me to call this constructor without at the same time sending an alert uh, or a message. Uh, and the idea is that the constructor that's left behind should uh, become humbler and humbler. And um, OK, so that's the first step. So essentially, don't do real work in the constructor. But so far, with this version, we still have a little problem in there, is that to construct this object, we have to construct all of its collaborators. Not use them, but construct them. And that's, a, that's a little bit of a pain, because I, want, I don't want to use time provider. I want to use state time provider. But by the time I constructed this object, it's already constructed the collaborator. It's not so bad, because it constructed a collaborator, but it's an inert construction. This constructor didn't do anything, because just like here, you moved all the active code from the constructor time provider in, in some other start method. Um, OK? So now we're going to have to deal with what do we do? Uh, how do we replace these actual collaborators with uh, with DOM? So remember, we had we had this slide where we said, well, if you can't remove a collaborator, then double it. And I had this definition here, which I'm going to skip over. Um, so we're going to be writing doubles, face, for our collaborators. But the question is, how do we actually get them used? Uh, how do you put them in your production flow? So I think this might be a good time. Um, to actually stop for to me. The first one is that uh, on Tuesday, there's no lecture. Cancel the lecture on Tuesday. Um, and, but I, I have something for you to have fun uh, meanwhile. Um, so no lecture uh, on Tuesday, which is 28, maybe? 27, thank you. Uh, the second is um, 
quiz six. Uh, so I believe you are working now on a quiz that's due tonight. And the next quiz, it's also going to be for a week, but it's uh, quite a bit more complex. It's a little programming uh, assignment. So it's not just the kind that you go over the, the slides and, and study them and answer. You actually have to download the package and do some coding. Uh, coding and learning a library for testing with mocks and spies. Um, I, I want to warn you to not leave it. It's not something you can do in an hour. Okay? It's going to take uh, at least two hours uh, to do. But it may take longer. So uh, it, then there's multiple tasks. And uh, we need you to commit your code uh, for, for each task. And we want to see that you've started early, uh, if there's any talk about the regrade or anything like that. I mean, don't leave it to the last minute. Um, I'm very excited about this assignment because it's, um, it's uh, using an open source testing library that I've just finished with uh, one of my students. It's based on an idea that I've used extensively for five years uh, at Conviva in, in four different big projects, web application projects, some of them like yours. And I think it works uh, extremely, uh, extremely well. And I want you to, to try it and see for yourself. And um, we, we created this uh, uh, application that they're going to be testing that um, accesses the AC Transit bus database to find out where are the buses right now. Uh, you pick a bus stop and will tell you what distance the buses are from that bus stop. Okay? It's not something you'll probably use very much, but uh, it's actually something that for its size, it's, it's somewhat tricky to test. Okay, so uh, start early. That's the message here. And since there's no lecture, you have an extra hour and a half to work on it. Um, the uh, next one coming up, um, coming mini lectures. Have you seen my post on Piazza about mini lectures? Okay. Uh, good. So the moment I uh, we post the form, the reason I wanted to think ahead is not something you can decide on the spot. But the the first teams to um, respond, they get priority in the choice of the dates that they want. There's five lecture slots, and you get to pick your preferences. And typically, it happens that the later ones. Some teams prefer the later. Some teams prefer the earlier. Um, and I want you to have your, your choice. Also coming, uh, actually, any questions about mini lectures? I put examples. There's a, three examples of mini lecture slides on the web. You can see uh, what's involved. It's not an easy thing, because I want it to be lecture uh, for 10 minutes, or maybe a little bit less. OK? Um, but the good thing is that you can choose on what lecture. The other one is uh, peer evaluation. So in this class, part of your project grade will be affected by what, by what your teammates think about your contribution relative to the rest of the team. Okay? And we are going to do a mock peer evaluation in a, in a little bit, in, a, in maybe 10 days, when you're done with iteration two. Same format as the real one. And you're going to get your anonymized feedback from your teammates and scores, but we don't use those numbers. That kind of gives you a heads up uh, what's going on in your team. Um, and we do it again the day of the demo at the end, after the demo. And that matters. Um, and it can make big changes. Okay? So if you've done more than your share and your teammates recognize that, they will, they will reward you, believe me. Uh, they'll give you some of their points. I, I see that happening every year. Okay? Uh, many teams, they work so well together that they'll just give themselves essentially equal grades, and then, then everybody gets the grade of the project. Uh, but in some teams, there's people who haven't done their share, and some of those points will be taken and given to people who have done more than their share. Okay? Any questions about that? No? It means you are reading really the web page very carefully, because everything is explained there. Um, okay, so let's um, 
I have no interview question today, or the one that I have actually. It's, uh, I had, uh, as it happens, I'm going to Conviva on Wednesday. Yesterday I had two interviews. Um, and one of the interviewers was a senior person, so I asked the question that I, I'll bring up. You, you're, it's not ready. You're not ready for it. Um, at the end of this class, we're talking about how to scale a Rails app to deal with millions of people. I mean, how do you, and somebody, he had a Rails app. He built a Rails app, app at his previous job. And, and um, he's saying, okay, uh, you have a certain traffic. How, you log into the machine. How can you tell me what is the bottleneck? Like, how much more can you handle? What's going to break first? The CPUs, processes, file descriptors, networks. And how do we go from there? And how much you can go on this machine? Or what bigger machine you need if your boss tells you that you need a million users? Um, okay, so we'll kind of touch on that at the end of this, of, of this class. But truly, honestly, that's another class in itself. Uh, it's something that I don't know any school that teaches it for real. Because it's something you, you have to experience. Um, okay, so there was a question about the material. Yes? Yeah, uh, maybe like five slides ago, you were talking about the like humble, humble testing methods. Uh, let me, something was... Yes? This one? So, so it looks like on tick is supposed to like abstract all the complex logic into certain variables, right? Like time equals one of the complex things. Well, but this is equals. this is not the complex logic. It's a it's a complex interaction to get the time. The logic typically getting the time is a system call. Okay? There's no complexity in your code regarding that. So there's little chance for you to screw that up. There's complexity in the system to get the time. So the reason you split up on tick into those different things is so that you could test time without testing work, right? No. The reason this is, I wanted to take all of the complexity and replace it with this call. Because in the previous slide, it was all in here. And actually, these calls were not at the beginning. They were kind of put inside this complex logic wherever I needed the temperature or the time. All sprinkled throughout, mixing the complicated logic with talking to the collaborator. So that's, this is my goal, is to extract this with no dependencies on collaborators. Well, but it needs stuff from collaborators. So I pass those two arguments, and that's why I move the calls to the collaborators before this to prepare time and temp to pass them in. So does that actually save time, or does it just make the logic more like? No, it uh, saves absolutely no time. Okay. This is not for efficiency. This is refactoring for testing. It separates out the complicated logic from the interactions with collaborators. Because these are hard to test. This is easy to test. This is unit testable. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so uh, the first thing you could do, I, I'm going to show you several techniques for injecting dependencies to your collaborators in, in test. And uh, we're going to go from uh, the simplest technique to actually more complicated. We'll end up talking a little bit about uh, the Juice framework that Google uh, build and uses internally. Um, so the first thing is rewrite your constructor to avoid the calls to the constructor of the collaborators. Instead, pass those through the arguments to the constructor. So now, my constructor is truly does very little. It's very safe to call this, as long as you have a time, a temp, and an alert uh, provided. And you may want, since the real constructor requires all of this stuff, which is going to be very convenient for testing, but not so convenient for your production code. You may want to write a separate constructor, uh, let's call it real in, in this case, in which you are constructing the, the collaborators and calling this constructor. Okay? So this is going to be the constructor that the rest of your production code uses, because it needs a real-time provider, temp provider. And this is going to be 
the constructor that your tests are using. And the tests are gonna get, get a chance to provide their own implementations for time, temperature, and alertness. Okay, so um, this is how you write the test. You construct your fakes. Again, remember, these fakes are only for testing, so you should never see a call to fake time provider anywhere in the production code. It should be here. Then you, um, you configure the, this fakes. Remember, um, we have to configure the temperature provider to give it the time provider, the start temperature, rate, and end temperature. Now it's ready to go. And now you construct your, uh, the system under test giving it uh, these fakes of fake collaborators. Uh, and now you actually start the test. And because of the way this test is written, the actual initiating of the operation, it comes from the time provider. The time provider is the driver of this application. So you call the time provider and say, start at this time, go you know, increment second by second up to this time, and then call the on tick. Uh, when you call, when the time passes, because of this uh, fake step call, the temperature, fake temperature provider will advance its temperature. Also, main probably when you started main, you have uh, you have uh, registered the on tick handler with the temp time provider. So everything is hooked together and runs without using the actual temperature provider or the time provider or the alert Okay, and then at the end of the test you. You verify that you know everything is fine. There was one alert being sent at 1918, and, and so on. Yes. Does main construct it? Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, if I'm not familiar with Python, this is how you construct objects in Python. You, there's, there's no keyword new. Wait, so like in main, um, you don't like call start at start of it? Um, no. So the way this application is driven. Um, is driven from the time provider. The time provider has a timer that sends, calls, calls uh, the on tick method of main every second. It's not a typical application that starts from main. Um, okay, any questions? Yes. I remember there's a start method for SQQ, right? Yeah, I remembered it while I was talking. I, I missed that on the slide. Um, I should I should call uh, start here after SUT. There's a start method. It's it's the, because because main right now I can show you a previous slide doesn't do much. It just initializes these variables. It's the start that actually registers the onTick handler. So I should have called start. But if you don't, you'll see that your test does nothing. So you'll you'll figure it out. Questions? More questions? There, there's code to follow here, so yes, you have to be awake, but hopefully it's not too complicated. And to really, I mean, I, I'm, I'm building a little homework based on this uh, temperature provided for you to play with, because I think there's nothing like doing it. Um, hearing it is not quite the same. Okay, so. Uh, Let's say you don't want to use that dependency injection method, parameter dependency injection. The, the, an alternative that you may use is uh, to let the constructor construct its collaborators without passing them through. This simplifies your production code because then you can still call this constructor. But the secret is if all constructors in your system, all they do, they construct out of the constructors and set some variables, it's safe to let them call. Because yes, they constructed a time provider, but it's not like a message was being sent or state has changed or anything. It's an inert object. Um, and then the start method you know, registers the on tick. However, the idea is that after you construct main, before you call start, there's an opportunity for you to replace those. Okay, so we're gonna let main construct its collaborator. But before we start using main, we're gonna reach in and set those fields to what we want to be the collaborators. Here's how it goes. You construct main, but before you call start, you reach in using setters for these fields and stick in your uh, collaborators. 
Right? And it's not too late because main hasn't started to use the parameter. They're just constructing it. And now main, uh, you will achieve the same state that before was achieved by passing these through uh, the parameter list of main. Then, then you call uh, SVT start, which this time it looks like I haven't forgotten. Uh, then you set up your doubles and, and start, start the test. And then this will go up to 8 o'clock. And then you check the state uh, at the end. So as you can see, uh, I haven't shown you the fake alert provider, but it looks like this fake alert provider, um, it's remembering, um, or actually the SUT in this case, it's remembering how many alerts were being sent. So there's a history there that you can reach in and verify what has happened. Uh, with, the, with the library you'll be using in quiz six starting uh, tonight, this can be done uh, a lot nicer. You'll see. Any questions? Okay, can I move on? This is not really so much more complicated than before. Um, there's another alternative um, called uh, provider ser service providers or uh, singletons, sometimes they are called. The idea here is that sometimes the construction of the collaborators is not easily um, movable to the beginning of the constructor. Okay? Sometimes it's deep into your logic that you need access to one of these, or maybe you have a variable number of, of these time providers or temperature providers that you reach out in, in, in the middle of your code. Now, that's not great uh, code. But sometimes it's the code that you have. Sometimes it's the, the cleanest code to write. And uh, the technique that you can use there is to use this uh, pattern called singleton, or uh, provider service providers, in which you have a class that you can call to give you an instance of the time provider. Okay? So this plays the role of a constructor, creating a new object of time service, except you are reaching into a repository uh, where you are, you know, you're asking, give me an instance of of that provider. And the advantage of this is that this can be somewhere deep in your logic. That's why I have this dot dot dot. That's important because before I had them in the constructor, so I could reach in and replace it before it started to do the work. But now they're deep into the middle of the code. I can't reach in here and and change these things from outside before I start the code because it's in the middle of the logic. It's while the logic is running. So I have to have this kind of level of indirection. Um, but the, the important part is you don't have here a construction of the time provider. Because that would hard code in your logic the exact time provider you're going to use. I can't replace it with a fake time provider. You put in this provider service, which is kind of one step removed from the construction. And uh, as you may guess, I'm going to reach out into this time provider service and tell it, Next time you are asked for an instance, give it a fake instance. So this is how the code uh, runs. You create your fake instances. You go into the time provider service and you set these instances. So you take, tell this service, if somebody asks you for a time provider object, give it this uh, fake time provider. If not, construct one by default, uh, the actual collaborator and give it. That's probably the production one. Okay. And then, uh, then you call main and start, and again, I forgot to start, it looks like. Um, start the test and, and assert. Questions? Yes? Are the service provider, uh, like where did it <coughs> uh, place in the MVC framework? This is, uh, this is typically stuff that's done in the, in the controller, or um, it would be the view in Django, but the same kind of concept. Um, that's where you have the complexity, and uh, um, that's where you typically have this. But these are separate classes. In addition to the, I mean, right now when you run Rails, it creates classes for model views and, and controllers. That's, that's a toy application. Once you start having really serious stuff, you'll have your own class hierarchies of objects that are not models, not controllers, and not views. They are additional objects that have functionality. For example, you need to access the Dropbox API. You're going to build a class that abstracts the interface to Dropbox. It's probably going to be used in your 
uh, controller. But it's not going to be a controller. Other questions? No? Um, OK. There's uh, one other thing that I use uh, as a last resort sometimes when I don't want to use this uh, provider services. I actually write code in my production code, code that's only for testing. Okay? And I mark it with this kind of very visible Boolean flags. Uh, if testing use fake time, then um, I'm getting the time from, from the use fake time. Otherwise, I'm getting it from the time of life. Okay? So the idea here is that you're preparing your production code with special hooks for testing when it's not easy to kind of inject stuff using the previous mechanisms. So in some way, you're injecting this code for testing specifically, but you wrote it in the, in the test code. Some people dislike this profoundly. I actually use it uh, now and then because the alternative would be to kind of refactor the application to have one line method that you can fake uh, or create another class just for this line. Uh, that to me seems like even more um, junk to me a program than, than this line. Okay, So I'm going to speed up a little bit, uh, skip all of this slide. Um, do you want to cover in a couple of minutes uh, juice? How many of you have heard of, uh, of juice uh, written like this, pronounced like juice? No? Uh, it's a dependency injection framework uh, that developed at Google and it's used fairly extensively inside Google for writing code that makes it easy to, uh, to inject dependencies, it fakes, in place of collaborators. Okay? It's a... Um, Juice works, uh, the default version works for Java. It works quite well for Java. I've kind of taken the liberty to translate it to Python for the purpose of the slides. I didn't actually rewrite it in Python because I want to keep all my examples in, in Python. Uh, but the actual library is, is for Java. This is how it works uh, with Juice. It's a little bit like the provider service, except Juice now becomes the, this master provider of objects. Okay, so first, uh, whatever you, this is in your production code. Whatever you need to create collaborators or objects in general, you're going to ask Juice to, uh, to give you an injector. Okay? An injector uh, knows how to create instances of classes. So what you have done here, you have replaced the call to new time provider to create instance time provider. And by default, create instance will create an instance of this class. But there's an opportunity there for your test to configure the injector to give it a different time provider. Okay. Do you understand what I'm doing here for now? Okay. Um, so you never construct objects directly using the new constructor. You always use the injector create instance. Okay? So they like, they like to say that juice is the new new. I mean, whatever you use the keyword new, now you use uh, juice to construct it. So your code becomes, instead of having new class foo, new class bar, it's all create instance, create instance, create instance. And this is a, a, it's a cool thing because create instance is a method that you can change its behavior. New is a keyword that gets compiled in. There's no way after you compile your production code to do something else there. It's hard-coded in. This allows you dynamically to change the behavior of what happens when you want to create a time provider. And it's a very powerful concept. It's, it's a pattern. It's, it's called a factory pattern sometimes. Um, OK. So this is how tests uh, look with Juice. So first, you're going to configure Juice. And the way you do that is through a so-called module. And I don't know why they call it module, but there it is. Uh, this is what's important. Uh, you're binding. Uh, time provider to fake time provider. Essentially, you are telling Juice, when somebody asks you to construct an instance of time provider, uh, construct an instance of this fake time provider. And in Java, this has to be a subclass of time provider so that it's okay to pass it wherever the time provider is expected. Okay? And you do this, and for this particular test, this is how the code will behave. For another test, you could have another fake, or you could say use the real one. Or 
uh, or even have conditionals. The first time you get asked is the real one. The second time you use the fake one or something. You, you know, the sky's the limit. And then, then you take this configuration module and you, you, uh, you give it to Juice say install this. Uh, now Juice is ready to run. And now you simply call your production code. Your production code, whenever it needs a time provider, it's not gonna say new time provider. It's say Juice injector create instance. Juice will look up its configuration, give it a fake time provider, and everything goes on happy. And this can be, no matter how deep in the, in the, in the logic of your program is create instance, this way you can get to replace it, you know, whatever it is, okay? So uh, there's a lot of teams at uh, Google that uh, this is their program style. They don't call new anymore. They all, all they call is create, uh, create instance. Any, any questions? Okay. Um, <coughs> I, I'm gonna skip over the next couple of few slides. Um, I want to cover in five minutes something that I think is quite cool, quite important, and also has to do with the general topic of how do you organize your code for testability. But keep in mind, organizing for testability very often means making it modular, making it separating dependencies, making it easier to understand, easier to maintain. So it's, it's actually, you know, even if testing is not the <coughs> ultimate goal, if your ultimate goal is to produce clean code, this is a path to, uh, to that. Um, what I want to talk about now is to try to um, architect your code uh, with an eye towards where would be a good where would be a good abstractions to create in your application. Uh, if you use model view controller, the framework has already given you uh, AP abstractions. They said this is a model, and you have some mental ideas of what should be in the model, what not. This is the controller. This is the view. Furthermore, because you're writing Client server application, that's another abstraction that's imposed on you. This code runs on the server. This code runs in the browser. They talk to this API, okay? But beyond that, it's up to you. And if your application starts to be 100,000 lines, there's a lot of opportunity for creating a mess, even though you use model view controller client server architecture. So even in your code, you have to start to think of what might be the good, uh, good abstractions. And one way to think of an abstraction is to think of a scene. Uh, a scene, uh, imagine a big board, okay? Uh, it's all kind of uniform, and uh, there's no clear point where you could easily separate it, okay? And that's messy code. That would be messy code. Everything talks to everything. There's no clear uh, separation. But if you start hoisting things apart in crucial, you know, strategic places, you may see, you may see that this part of the board is very loosely connected with this part of the board. So it's easy to separate, maybe uh, you know, break it apart. Separate it such that you can replace one or the other half with a fake, with a mock, or with a different implementation for a different purpose, different project, okay? So it's important to try to create these scenes. Not everywhere, in strategic places. Um, so I want to skip to an example for how you will do this. This is an application that uses Dropbox for the storage, okay? And uh, somewhere in an application, you can insert this code, URL open. This is the uh, REST API for Dropbox to retrieve a file called myfile.txt. It's actually a URL request, and if the status is 200, if the status is 200, then the data is the contents of the file. And everywhere in your application where you need to get the file from Dropbox, you insert that kind of code. And everywhere where you want to write a file, you insert a post request where you pass in your content and uh, you do some error uh, recovery if you cannot save the data. I mean, you reach your quota or something. And now your code will work. If functionally, the code is fine. It's just that you have now inserted these dependencies on Dropbox everywhere in your code, okay? If you want to switch this from using Dropbox to Google Drive as your backend storage, it's a mess because it's all over the place. If you want to mock Dropbox, you don't want to run this actual code in, in tests because you don't want to be reaching out to the Dropbox API, messing up the stuff. It's hard, okay? So what should you do here? What do you think you should do? 
add, you have like two methods, one is save, one is get, and that's the URL open that, that will choose my function. Very good. You create an abstraction because you think this is a good place to place a scene in my application. Right now there's no scene because Dropbox API is connected to lots of places in the code. If you have a scene, all of the dependencies of Dropbox API are in a class, and then that class is used everywhere in the code. Okay, so there's many reasons why this is bad. I didn't mention that you need a special account, or it's actually hard to simulate errors. If you use the real Dropbox, how do you simulate that you exhausted your quota? It's a pretty messy test to write, okay? Um, so we're gonna write the Dropbox API, where you said delegate, I'll use uh, Dropbox API here. And it's gonna have a read method to read the file. So this is how my code looks now. I'm using Dropbox API name here, but the details of what URL request to what URLs, it's not here, okay? And uh, so this is how I would write the fake uh, rep implementation of Dropbox API. So essentially, I program the fake to say, if they ask you for this file, give them this content. And if they ask you for this file, give them this content. And then the read method simply looks up the file that you're asking for into these files here, and uh, creates a fake URL response with status to 200 and the contents of the file. Otherwise, it turns a 404, so now you can see your 404s. Um, and for write, you just put it into the hash table. So this is going back to what I told you before when I'm replacing the database with a little hash table. Here I'm replacing the whole Dropbox service with a little hash table. And it works because in your code you only need a simple rate, simple write. You don't need to implement the whole Dropbox API. You don't need to implement the whole Dropbox system which has you know, persistency issues, scalability, concerns. You don't need any of that. So it's just you know, half a page of code. And uh, I fully expect that you will be having things like this in your project because all of your projects will be talking to external APIs to do things. And this is how you should be doing your testing. Separate out those APIs into their own classes and write alternate implementation for the classes that don't have to be more complicated than this. Okay? Uh, and then what I have prepared, but I'm really uh, kind of out of time, is uh, in a few slides, testing asynchronous interaction. I think this is a really cool uh, example for something else that's very hard to test, um, that it shows how you can refactor things uh, to separate out the, the stuff that's hard to test because of collaborators as opposed to stuff that's actually complex and really needs to be tested. So it's a lot of more of a humble method kind of paradigm. And I think it's a very compelling example. We won't be covering it um, in lecture. I'll ask you to actually read the slides. Any questions before we wrap up? Okay, then. Uh, go, please, and fill in the, the feedback form. And um, I'll see you next Thursday then.